When we were kids, we used to draw small houses just like the one that the girl's drawing in the video clip. For every new line she draws, she places the marker at one point and slides it until she finishes the line. From the very beginning, she knows exactly where she wants every vertex of the house to be. This simple example reflects the classical Euclidean approach to geometry. We first place the points of a figure and then we connect the segments. The length of these segments are most likely of interest because they usually represent relative distances between the points. Finally, we would maybe use this information to compute something of interest in the figure. For example, the area of a field or the total square meters of a house. This Euclidean approach to realizing a geometrical figure requires that we know the positions of each of its vertices. Now, let's try a different approach. Instead of starting by placing the points and then connecting the segments, we suppose that this time we have the segments and their length available at the start. The goal now is to find the position of each of the vertices marked by the different colors, such that the lengths of all the segments are respected. Okay, let's try to rebuild our house using only the segments. Let's start by taking two segments that share the blue vertex. We can attach these because their color tells us that they are the same vertex in the resulting figure. Now, if we take this next segment and try to overlap the vertices, we see that we can form a triangle once we rotate the segments in the right way. Two of the last three sticks have vertices that are already in our figure, so let's try to place them. We see that the final segment forces the two walls of the house into being parallel. By placing it, we complete our drawing. The takeaway here is that this time around, we did not start by assigning the positions of the points. Instead, we started by defining the lengths of the segment and drew the figure by connecting them. The length of such a stick is defined by the Euclidean distance between the two points. This is why the challenge of drawing a figure in this way when starting from the distances is known in the scientific literature as the distance geometry problem. Alright, let's go back to our segments. Each segment is essentially a stick with two different colors marked at its extreme points. When we put these sticks together to form a geometrical figure, with the only constraint that we cannot overlap two different colors, then we are able to reconstruct the house essentially by only using some distances between the points in the figure. You are probably wondering whether we can arrange these same sticks in a different way so that a different geometrical figure is constructed. Yes, we can do this. When we invert the roof of the house, we obtain a shape that looks like an envelope. We can obtain another figure by applying a rotation and a shear, which gives us a strange looking shape. Then how many solutions can come from our distance-based approach? When the little girl was drawing, she had the house and only that. By changing our approach, it seems that we have introduced a certain level of uncertainty. But wait, our house is moving! All conformations that it's taking on are compatible with our rules, because all vertex colors are respected. The number of solutions seems to be infinite, because we can shear the house however we want. Okay, some of you might say, there's no problem here. We have the same house that the girl was drawing, no matter if we share it or not. Well, we do not really have the same thing. While drawing, the girl anchored the vertices of her figure in specific positions on the paper. Instead, our approach may lead to the vertices being in different positions than we would like. In this specific example of the house, we even have an infinite number of different combinations in which we can place the vertices. This leads us to an important note about the problem that we are trying to solve. The distance geometry problem may have an infinite number of solutions. Nobody wants to live in a house with walls that can be blown away even by a light breeze. The more supporting beams a house has, the more stable it gets. Let's see if this is the same for our approach. 
Will adding a stick allow us to avoid these continuous deformations of the house? What will happen to our house when we try to share it after we add this extra stick? When we share it this way, we see that the length of the new stick is not respected. When we share the other way, the stick is too long to fit. By adding this extra segment, we made sure that the house cannot be shared anymore. When we shear, the length of the new stick is not respected, which means that the figures that we obtain are not valid solutions to our problem. Alright, but then how many solutions do we have now? Do we only have the house? Not really. For instance, we can still make the envelope. However, adding this extra stick made sure that the number of solutions that we have is now finite. When we have an instance of the distance geometry problem with a finite number of solutions, we say that the problem is discrete. This teaches us something new. While the distance geometry problem may have an infinite number of solutions, when we have an instance with enough distances, we can discretize the search space. Now let's look at a commonly used method to solve such discrete instances. We start by assigning a label to each of our vertices. For the house, we will do this from the top to the bottom, but other orders work as well. Now let's build our house again, vertex by vertex, following the order. We start by taking the first two points, green and blue, placing the stick that connects them. Where we place the stick determines where on the paper our house will appear. The rotation of the stick determines the complete rotation of the resulting figure. For the correctness of the solution, it does not matter how we place or rotate it. Next, let's add the third orange colored point. To place it, we have two sticks that we can use, from green to orange and from blue to orange. We can use these sticks to draw two circles, one around the green point and one around the blue point. As the radius of each of these circles, we use the length of the sticks. We see that the circles intersect in two points. When we use either of these two points for orange, we know that both sticks are respected, because we used their length to define the circles. Choosing the intersection on the right will get us one step closer to our house. Let's place the red point. Again, we have two sticks available, so we can use our circle intersection technique. Note that if we did not have the extra diagonal beam available, we would not be able to place the red point using this method, because we would only have one circle instead of two. Alright, let's intersect and place the vertex. Finally, Let's again use the same intersection technique to place the final purple point. We see that we have now arrived at our house. However, recall that at every step of our method we had two intersection points available. You may be wondering what would happen if we were to make a different choice when placing the vertices. Actually, each of the combinations of choices corresponds to a different solution for the problem. Because we have two options at every step, we can represent the solution space by a binary tree, where every path from top to bottom represents a solution. When building the house, we picked the right-hand intersection point at every choice. Therefore, the highlighted path leads to our house. The path where we make the left-hand choice when placing the red vertex leads to the envelope. Finally, all paths on the left half of the tree are induced by making a different choice for orange. These are simply flipped versions of the solutions for the paths on the right, like this one. Actually, there is a partial reflection that transforms any solution from one side of the tree to the flipped solution on the other side. The method that we just used to identify each one of the possible solutions is known as the branch and prune algorithm. The name is derived from the binary tree that represents our discrete solution space. 
Now we know that when we have a discrete instance of the problem, we can use the branch and prune algorithm to find all possible solutions. The distance geometry problem belongs to the category of problems that are hard to solve. The fact that some instances can be discretized does not affect its complexity. The applications of distance geometry are several. Structural biology and sensor network localization represent the two classical applications of distance geometry. One more application is found in animation and computer graphics. Many people have worked on distance geometry, too many to mention in this video. If you are interested in a topic, you can use a search engine of choice to find many interesting articles. The intention of this video was to give a very simple introduction to distance geometry. A lot more can be said as a lot of research has been performed on the topic, with new contributions regularly appearing. For any questions, do not hesitate to exploit the comment section. We will try to read all your comments and answer them. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you in the next video.